Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Today we're going to talk about public excellence, and this is going to be a lot different than the kind of joins you see in the intro class and even in the last lecture we just had about parallel hash joins. Um, and we'll sort of see, sort of motivate why we want to do this, discuss the sort of one of the first implementations of it, and then we'll see how the, the Germans are going to prove on it. And then I'll finish up with something from DuckDB that basically says you may not actually need, need any of this if you build other things correctly. Um, all right, so last class, we spent the entire lecture on how to do hash joins as fast as possible. Right? And the big focus was on how to use, run this in parallel. Again, not across multiple nodes, right, but across multiple workers running on, on the same box. And it was really about m trying to minimize the, the, the number of cycles per instruction, minimize the remote memory access to the different new regions, and just trying to run fast as possible. And then although there were some examples and some results that showed that the partition hash join was going to be superior to the other approaches, um, you know, get, getting the engineering right for the different hardware, different workloads, different data sets is really challenging. So oftentimes, you should just do a, a non-partition hash join. And that's going to be good enough to get, you know, to get you maybe 95, 90 to 95% of the benefit without again, getting into the low-level details of performance things. So again, for this for the last lecture, this was doing a, what is called a binary join, right? or joining two tables. Right? And you know, as you can imagine, these things are super common in, uh, in pretty much every, every database system, every relational database system. Right? There's been years and years and years, decades of research in trying to make hash joins go as fast as possible. As I said, uh, I had a PhD student spent a little time trying to make you know, the, the hash join go faster. And we were literally going, trying to count from going from 12 cycles per tuple to 11 cycles per tuple. But you're really getting down to the, you know, the, the bone of bare metal performance that there's not much else you can, you can optimize. So the binary joins are going to be the preferred approach, the better approach, when we know that the output of the join operator is going to be smaller than, than its inputs. Right? So in this case here, we're joining R, S, and T. We're taking uh, we'll join S and T. We do a, you know, do a join, and then we're going to produce 10 tuples. Right? These are imaginary numbers. They're small, but think, think, think of like orders of magnitude bigger. Right? The output is going to be much smaller. The problem is going to be, though, and what we're going to try to adjust today, is when the output of the join operator is going to be larger than the inputs. So say for whatever reason, based on the data and, and the, what we're trying to join on, this thing operator is not going to produce 1,000 tuples. Right? And this is the problem we want. We want to, we, we, this is the worst case scenario for databases because now we have to materialize that. And even though like, you know, it's producing 1,000 tuples here, when we do the join on this output and R, now we're going to produce 10 tuples. So we had a bunch of data that we've materialized or synthesized from the join operator that we now have to deal with, uh, even though you know, we're going to end up still ending up throwing, throwing a ton of it away. So another way to think about it or look at it is, is, is like this, where you actually start using real, real tuples. Again, same query, trying to do uh, a cycle join between R, R S, and T. Right? So the problem is going to be that no matter what order that I, I choose to join my tables, um, so if, I, if I choose to join R and S first, then join, join T, okay, the, this intermediate result is going to get ballooned up and get bigger. Same thing, if I try to join uh, R and T and then join S, ballooned up, same thing, do S and T, balloons up uh, in the end. So again, the reason why this is going to be a problem for us is, I've already said, it's going to be wasted storage because now again we have to materialize these results uh, somewhere in memory, and then if it gets too big, we have to end up having to spill a disk, and that'll be typically the local disk on, on the worker node. Um, worst case scenario, we spill to uh, S3 of the object store. That's even slower. But then, of course, obviously, it's going to be a bunch of wasted computation because you know, we're, we're, we're materializing tuples, we're passing them along, and then we're going to do the, when we do the, the next join on the last table. It's not going to match. We're going to end up throwing it away. So ideally, we, we want to be able to identify, if we can, which of these tuples we actually don't need when we're going to join with the third table or, th or th any other additional tables to avoid having to you know, get, get materialize it. So that's the high-level approach the, the problem we're trying to solve today, is how to avoid this, this blow-up of the intermediate results. Right? And the, what we'll see in the multi-way join, the way it's going to work is that rather than sort of 
thinking the join operator in terms of like, I got you know, this table and this table, let me join them together. You're going to think in terms of attributes. And now you don't care where the attributes are coming from, whether it's table one, table two, table three, or so forth. And now you want to do comparison on these attributes and then have that be what you, what you synthesize as part of the output. All right, so that, that's the big picture of what the multi-way join is, is going to try to do for us. So uh, first sort of background, what, what worst case optimal joins are. Again, the lecture I'm calling uh, multi-way joins because that's the, uh, the idea, like we're joining uh, more than just two tables. Right? So the, the, the class algorithms are going to be multi-way joins. And then these category of the implementations that we'll see will be called worst case optimal joins. But typically, the, the terms are used interchangeably. But multi-way joins, the idea of multi-way joins existed in the literature, I think, back in the 80s. But the worst case optimal implementations, that came along in the late 2000s. All right, so first, first again, the highlight idea of what worst case optimal joins are. Then we'll look at the, one of the earliest implementations of leapfrog join, leapfrog try join. And then we'll see the Germans hash try join, which is to be sort of an optimization of the data structures they're going to use over the leapfrog join. But at high level, the, the, the method's still going to be the same. Again, we'll and then we'll finish up some quick optimizations from, um, from DuckDB. And then I want to do, briefly talk about how to do system profiling in, in a database system, and then talk a little bit about the hardware counter stuff uh, that he had a question about uh, a few weeks ago. OK? All right, so again, the, the, the idea of a worst case optimal join is that we want to, do, we want to join more, or three or more tables at, at the same time. And again, the way this is going to work is that rather than taking the entire tuple from one table and the entire tuple from another table and then comparing all the attributes in our join key, we're instead going to grab a single attribute for our join key, right? It could be multiple columns, from all the tables we want to join together, mash them up, figure out what, whether we have any matches, and only proceed with doing additional comparisons for a given attribute, uh, for a given tuple, if we know that the subset of the values on our join key are actually matching already. Right? Again, we want to avoid a waste of work of like doing a bunch of comparisons for things that aren't going to get thrown away. So as soon as we can identify that there isn't going to be a match on a given tuple as we're, as we're doing our join, we can throw that away as soon as possible. So as I said, the idea of a multi-way join has existed for a while. But the, in terms of proving that you can have a worst case, uh, worst case optimal join, and I'll define what that is in a second, um, came from these other Germans in 2008, which I think was, for this paper, I think actually was Thomas Neumann's, Thomas Neumann's PhD advisor, but I might be wrong. Um, but then the first two implementations of this will be uh, empty headed out of Stanford, and then a commercial system called Logic Blocks, um, which is think of, think of like it's a, it's a answering database system that you use data log instead of SQL. Data log is a, another declarative query language, um, but very few people actually use that other than logic blocks. Um, all right, so again, the, the, what's going to be inter inter interesting about these worst case optimal joins are rather than thinking about the computational complexity in terms of the, um, you know, the size of my input tuples, it's going to be the performance going to be bounded by the size of, of, of the output and the number of attributes we're actually going to compare against. And this is hard to actually have an exact estimation without select selectivity information about the, the, the attributes um, to say, here's how much longer things are going to take. Whereas like something like a, like, a, like a hash join, for example, you know you got to build a hash table. There's a cost to that. You've got to probe the hash table. There's another cost to that. Um, and you can more or less ignore the, the selectivity of, of the hash join itself because you're always going to do that work. Whereas in, in the worst case optimal join, because we can short circuit comparisons once we know an attribute within the join key is not going to match, then it actually is, you know, it'll, it'll vary. So what's also interesting about too is that the, the more tables we're going to throw at, at our worst case optimal join algorithm, the better its performance is actually going to be relative to the input because the idea is that we're going to try to compare as much as we can all at once. Again, rather than having these, these stages about in the, um, you know, in a, in a binary join. Yes? The statement is the question is, would all the things I'm talking about here still hold if it was joint key was just one attribute? Um, in terms of would you, well, you, so you wouldn't get the benefit of short-circuiting short -circuiting additional comparisons, right, for additional attributes. Uh, like is, is that a, an easier problem if it's just one attribute? His question is, is, is it an easier problem if it's, if it's one attribute to do like a multi-way join? Um, no, I mean, you, you wouldn't, how does this? You, 
you wouldn't get any benefit of some, of some of the data structures that they're going to build, like the tries or in the case of empty head, it's like nested hash tables. Um, yeah, I, I actually don't know the complexity of, of this thing. If it's one attribute, if it's one attribute, I still think it's, it's, this is going to be better if, if the intermediate results are going to balloon up. Because again, you're not materializing it. But all those optimizations that like we'll see from from the paper you guys read, like of like how to do uh, singletons and fast pass down to the, to the leaf nodes of the try, like those obviously don't make any sense if it's a, if it's only one level. Yeah. So we'll see this a little bit, and, and the hyper paper you guys read or the umbra paper you guys read talks about this as well. Like in the same way that we had to get the join order right for binary joins, like make sure like if it a join b join c, we have to get that ordering right. We had to get the ordering correct in uh, a worst case optimal join, but the thing we have to worry about is not so much the, the ordering of the tables themselves, it's actually the ordering of the attributes. So we want to do comparisons on attributes that we know they're going to be most selective uh, as soon as possible. So again, we start throwing away data and not doing useless computations. So the, the definition that's sort of floating around the internet uh, and actually comes from this professor up in Waterloo for uh, He's building an embedded graph database called um, Kuzu. You think of, think of like, um, think of like you know, DuckDB or SQLite, but for, for graph databases, right? And so his definition of a worst case optimal join is, is one where the, the worst case runtime of the algorithm meets a known lower bound for the worst case runtime of any join algorithm. So I read this, I'm like, what the hell is he talking about, right? Because like you're kind of using the, the definition of the thing using what the word you're trying to def define in, the, in the, the definition itself. Um, so an alternative would be something like this, where the, a worst case optimal join is one where the runtime of the join algorithm is better than all other join algorithms where the query and the data represent the worst possible scenario. So if you, if you have the, the situation where the intermediate size is going to balloon up massively, like think of like a Cartesian product as the worst case scenario, then we want to choose an algorithm where it's not going to be you know, magically log in. Uh, but it's still going to be better than just doing all other approaches with a binary join, no matter what ordering you have for, for your, your tables in a binary join. So again, if you just, if you, that's why I'm, I, I called this, this lecture the, the multi-way join, because that one I think we can, we, is easy to wrap our head around. This one is a bit screwy. Uh, and it, don't take my word for it. Also, for this guy's blog article, he has this uh, anecdote where he talks about where he met Don Knuth. And he told Don Knuth he was working on worst case optimal join algorithms. And Knuth was like, what the hell are you talking about either? Right? So uh, as he says, are they so good that they're optimal in, even in the worst case performance? Yes. So anyway, so again, if you understand that like, this is going to be the best approach for the worst case scenario when we have this, again, ballooning up the enemy results. That's, that's the thing we want to solve. So as I said, there's, there's not very many systems that are actually going to implement this. Um, so the, the logic blocks was the one I mentioned before. That's going to be, we'll, we'll see this when they do comparison again in the, um, in the Umbra paper. Um, again, this was an early reasoning system that was trying to do, again, graph traversals. Uh, and they had, uh, they supported, they had an early implementation of, of, or they had a leapfrog hash join. Umbra, what you guys read about, relational AI is the follow-up to logic blocks. So logic blocks got bought. All the key people left the company, ever got acquired, and then, then built relational AI. Um, it's written in Julia. It's a relational database system that's doing, um, uh, what, doing a, a graph representation on a relational database system, and they're using their variant of a, a newer version of the leapfrog join. Um, and the Kuzu is the system out of Waterloo that I mentioned before. So the reason why this is going to be important, and we're not going to go too deep into uh, the latest SQL extension, uh, SQL PGQ, um, but Last year, in March or February, the new specification for the SQL standard came out. And in, in it, they have this thing called SQL PGQ. So it's an extension, a new, new, uh, new capabilities in the SQL standard that allow you to define property graphs over relational tables and then do uh, pattern searching or graph traversals directly in SQL. So the, 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 the extensions are inspired by uh, Neo4j's Cypher. I think TigerGraph has their graph query language. Like there's bits and pieces of, uh, of existing graph databases, but now all this exists in the SQL standard. Um, the only system that I know that actually supports this is, uh, is, is Oracle. Oracle was on the standards, standards committee. Um, the, there's, a, there's a 
experimental uh, development branch of, of, of DuckDB that has some portions of this, but they're all, the language is all sort of slightly different. Um, so we're gonna, need, we're gonna need the worst case optimal joints in order to implement this efficiently, right, for these kind of queries, to do graph traversals on, on, uh, on, on relational databases. So that's why this matters. So even though again, Oracle only supports it now, I think in the next five years, every major OLAP data system will have, will have support for this. And you're gonna to need to do a worst case optimal join to make that run efficiently. All right, so let's go to the first implementation, or first one of the first implementations, leapfrog, leapfrog try join. And then, uh, and then we'll see how the Germans extended this to make it, make it run faster. Um, so the idea is that to do a, a multi-way join, the, the leapfrog try join is going to assume that either the data is already pre-sorted or that you're going to build a, an index data structure on the join keys uh, right before performing the join itself. So as we talked about in, in our world, we're, we're accessing a bunch of parquet files sitting on S3. Those things are unlikely to be sorted. And in the parquet and orc file specifications, you can't store additional data structures. So either we have to pre-compute these things and store it as a bunch of separate files that we load back in, or as we're scanning data, we're building these tries on the fly. And the, the Umber paper you guys read, they're gonna be doing the same thing. They're gonna be building the tries on, on the fly too, but they're gonna do a bunch of tricks to try to do lazy evaluation or lazy materialization in the data structure. Right? So another way to think about this is, when I call create index in Postgres or whatever, what is that, what's gonna happen? Well, the data system does a sequential scan, reads every single row, and then populates the index. And so the Umber guys are, are gonna to try to avoid having to do that. These guys are gonna, are gonna build everything. So in this try, we'll see in a second, they're gonna have a, a separate data structure per table or per relation we're trying to join. And then each level in this try is gonna co correspond to one attribute that we're, that, that's in our join key. All right, for that, for that table, each level will correspond to a, an attribute that it has that's in, involved in the join operator. So as I said, logic blocks invented this in 2010, um, or two, 2013, I think, or 14 paper came out. They have their new company, Relation AI. They have an, supposedly a better version of the leapfrog hash join called a dovetail join. Uh, I, I can't actually figure out what they're doing because there's a five minute, you know, there's this blog article here and a five minute YouTube video that doesn't really say anything deep, right? Um, but they claim it's better than, than what these guys had. All right, so the, the way they think about this is that we are, again, we're going to sort our data or build it next for it, and then we're gonna need a way to, to iterate through the, the, all the tables we're trying to join at the same time, and then do comparison across the attributes to see whether we have a match. And because the things are, are, are sorted, we, we, we don't have to backtrack uh, on our join keys, right? So let's say we have three tables, X, Y, Z. First step, we're just gonna sort it, so that's fine. And then for now, for this demonstration, I'm going to switch to a horizontal view, and I'm going to put spaces into where there's actually no values you know, corresponding to the, the sequence, like you know, 0 to 10. So at the very beginning, we're going to have an iterator for each of the three tables. right? So in this case here, we're, we're trying to join in one attribute, ID. And so the, for x, the first value is 0. So the x iterator, x iterator is pointing at 0, y is pointing at 0, and then z is pointing at 2. So we're going to start with the, at the top. And we're going to sort of we're going to do comparisons with the what the iterator is pointing at across the different uh, the different tables because we know what they're pointing at too. And if we find it that the value that our iterator is pointing at is less than what the other iterators are pointing at, then we know that there isn't a match for us here, and therefore we're going to leapfrog or jump to some other point in our in our value list that's gonna be equal to or greater than the, the maximum what everyone else is pointing to, right? So in this case here, uh, zero is less than two, so we need to jump over and find the next, the, the, the next value for x uh, that is greater than or equal to two. In this case here, it's three, so the iterator is gonna jump o over there, and we update that down. Now because this guy now did a jump, we now need to come down to the next one and do the same comparison here. So the actuator is pointing at zero, so it needs to find a, uh, since zero is less than two and three, we need to now jump to another position where the, uh, where the next value is greater than or equal to three, right? 
So even though it has a two, so we know this guy is pointing at three, so we know that there isn't going to be a match because otherwise this thing would have been pointing at two as well. So we skip this. So he's now going to leapfrog or jump over to six. Same thing, come down here. He's at two. Two is less than six. Two is less than three. So we need to find something that's going to be greater than or equal to six, which is eight here. Then we loop back around and do the same thing. Now the x iterator can jump to eight. The y iterator can jump to eight. And then lo and behold, we have a match. So at a high level, this is conceptually what we're trying to do. But obviously, the devil's in the details, because how am I doing this jump, right? Because use sequential scan would be stupid and slow. Uh, and I'm also only showing how to do this for a sing single, single attribute, right? So the way they're going to represent the, these, these values in this sort of, the, in sort of manner is through a try. Assuming everyone here knows what a try is, right? Because that's the project zero. OK. So I'll, I'll skip what a try is. Actually, the guy that, that coined the name, Edward, Edward Franken, he was his faculty at CMU. I think he just died last year. So the try guy died. Um, OK. So we now need to build a try for every single table. And where we're going to have each level in the try is going to represent a single attribute. So like, this will be slightly different than the try representation we think of in databases, like to replace a B plus tree. Because in a try, you would take a, um, say, a string value, and you'd break it up into different digits or radixes and store those as a single level. And here, we're going to store the entire value in, in a, a node at a level for each, for, you know, corresponding to a tuple at a table. But we're not going to have any duplicate values, right? So if we see the same value at a, for a given attribute over and over again, We'll, just ha we'll have one instance of it, but we'll have multiple pointers coming out of it for the different uh, sub-values for the next attribute. All right, so again, I'm going to just flip it on its side to make it, make it easier to visualize. Um, so we have two attributes, A and B. So in the first step here, we want to build a, uh, we want to add an entry in our try for these three zeros. So we always start with the root, traverse down, and generate the, the, the zero node. And then we come down to the, B, and then for all the, the, the B values that correspond to the zero values, we're going to have edges coming out of them uh, and, have, and have those three values. Right? And again, just scan down the line, do, do the same thing for 1 and 0, and then for, for 2 and 0. So again, anything at the, this first level here, ignoring the root, right? this is corresponds to attribute A. Everything below that at the second level is going to be attribute B. And then depending on how many attributes I have in my join key, all right, this keeps, keeps going down and down. Right? And then in this leaf node here, obviously, with, with, when they have the same parent, right, uh, they're going to be in sorted order. All right, so now let's put this together in a, in a, in a uh, complete, complete example to do a join between R, S, and T here. Um, so I've already built the, the tries for the, for the three tables. And again, here in our join, we're trying to join R, S, and T. We're trying to join to R, R dot A equals T at dot A, R dot B equals S dot B, and S dot C equals T dot C. So in this case here, every one relation does not have all of the attributes that we need to compute the join. And so assuming that the optimizer has figured out that the optimal join, join sorry, optimal uh, evaluation ordering for our attributes is going to be A, B, and C. So for this, say we start with table R. And we start at the root, traverse down. The first entry is going to be, uh, the first level is going to be A. The first value you can see for A is 0. So then we can use this value to now do a lookup in the table T. So again, since our join is r.a dot dot equals t.a. Dot so then now, as an entry point going into the root of this try, we come down to, to the first level, and we have a, a value. We have A equals, equals 0. We have a value, matching value there. So now what we need to do is traverse down. At this point here, since we know we have a match in for, for r.a equals 0 and t.a equals 0, then we need to now go to the level below them and actually start comparing the, the tuples or the values for the different attributes at the next level. So in this case here, the next level for table r is going to be b. So, we can, so when we go down to go down the left side, the first value we're going to hit is 0. So we can use that now as the probe into the the try for table S because we're trying to do R dot B equals S dot B, right, in the, you know, in our, in our where calls up there. So same thing, we, we enter R, sorry, we enter the try for S, traverse down, now we match for B. 
Great. So now we know that we have for a match of at least an attribute for r dot a to t dot a and r dot b into s dot b. So the last step now is to do the comparison for where s dot c equals t dot c. So to do this, we're just going to have iterators in the in the region that or the, the linked list or the, the list that's below the, the the first attribute in the try for t and s. And we're just going to scan along and accumulate all the values for, for C across these two different, uh, you know, for these two different tables, right? And then now we, have a, now we have a set. We just do the intersection. And it tells us whether we, we have matches. And we know how to fill in the values for A and B because we know how we got into our try in the first place. So we probed in here, got A equals 0. We had a match there. Then we had b equals 0, had a match over there. So when we fill this out, we know what the values in a and b are. So we're just doing the intersection over c. Yes? What if the order in the, the relation has um, couple, um, like b to b? The question is, what if, what if the ordering of the relation? Yeah, if c goes on top of b, uh, how would it go? Uh, sorry, I don't understand. If, it's, if c goes on top of b, what do you mean? Oh, sorry. So if I if I put this above this, you can't do that. Because I, I know what I know the global or, I know the global evaluation ordering, A B C. So in my try, even though I don't have all the attributes in, for a given table, I still have to follow that ordering. So B's got to come before C. So the order is determined. The, the, the order is determined by the query optimizer before you start running this. It's the same as join order when you're doing a binary join. Yes? Is it OK to have one try per table, or do we need one for every possible order and subset of the attributes? His question is, is it OK to have one try per table, or do you need to have one try for every possible join ordering? So the, this brings up a good point. The, I think the empty-headed paper, and I think this paper says you'd want to uh, pre-compute these ahead of time. So all possible join orderings, you would have to pre-compute them. The Umber guys claim, and I think they're correct, that like, that's super wasteful. Uh, and, it, you know, and you would just build it on the fly. And that's better than trying to pre-populate everything. OK, so we did a match where a equals 0, b equals 0, and we got all the c's for that. So now all we need to do is start back over here with our b iterator in table r. Just go to the next one. Do the same thing. Probe, probe into table S. Uh, you know, follow along the path, get the B. Now we have an iterator for, for the C value over here. For this one here, because we're still at, at the same A value, that we don't need to, you know, we don't we don't need to, to, to switch over to another another leaf leaf node. We just restart and go back at the beginning of our linked list here. Same thing. Scan along, and uh, and so now we would only end up with one entry for s.c, and then three entries for, for t.c. You obviously could cache this, because you know it's going to be the same thing every time. Compute the intersection, and then we end up, end up with one tuple. Right? Then do the same thing, move over to the next one, traverse down into to, to the s, get our, get our, uh, you know, get our sets of, of c values, intersect, and produce the tuple. So again, now at this point here, since we've exhausted all the b's, and we're, so we're done with this a. We go back up to the root, come down to the next side. Now we get a equals 1, probe into the try for, for t. a equals 1, we got a match. Do the same thing, scan along, and then, and then do the intersection. Right? Same thing, come to 2, and so forth like that. Not so bad. So related to his point, either pre-computing or building the try on the fly, for, you know, every time you want to do this join, is going to be expensive. Right? And always think in extremes. If you have billions of tuples, uh, having to build this try in, you know, across every single table every single time is going to be uh, slow. And even though in our world we're assuming our data set is read-only, whereas the hyper paper you, they were talking about supporting incremental increment updates, um, again, trying to figure out all possible join ahead of time and then materialize them and then fetch them in from disk every time you get a join is going to be impractical. Yes? 
need for every join order? Don't you just have like one total order over the attributes that you build the tries with respect to that? His question is, what do you mean? What I mean by building over every possible join ordering? Wouldn't you have one ordering of the attributes? No, right? So. In my example, ABC was the optimal ordering for given the data. But what if I added a bunch of where clauses or conditional predicates that start filtering from A, filtering B and C, or R, S, and T before I join? So now the, 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 the ordering can be completely different from one query to the next. Yeah. So trying to figure that out for every single possible combination is, is, is wasteful. So the, the empty head approach from Stanford what they're going to claim that's going to be better than the, this, this try is just use nested hash tables. But again, this is, this, this is going to be expensive to do as well, even if, even if you're building them on the fly. And this is probably because the, the, the hash table, despite the, the, how great it was for doing a binary join we saw last class, in this world is going to be really expensive because you're just, just doing so many different hash lookups over and over again. Um, and a lot of it is going to be wasteful. Right? So the Umber guys would argue that if you use hash tables for this, you're going to at least have to do one key comparison to see whether you, know, you have a collision in your hash table and do a lookup. And then, but you still need to store the actual keys or the pointer of the tuple is to deal with collisions. And now you're just trashing your CPU cache because you're jumping on to random locations over and over again for all these nested hash table data structures. Right? In the case of the binary hash join, it's one hash table. Now it can be big enough where it can, it's going to pollute my CPU cache, but there will be still some locality in, in that because I'm not you know, traversing different paths and reading a bunch of different random things all the time. The other argument that they're going to claim is that uh, you, you, if you have variable length keys or strings, then you still, you still need to use dictionary encoding to make sure that you, you, know, that you can keep things all nicely aligned in your data structure. Um, and that means potentially uh, still having to do lookups in the, in the dictionary to go figure out what the actual value is when you want to do uh, maybe deeper comparisons. So these are all the flaws of the early worst case optimal join approaches <coughs> that the Umber guys are trying to fix with, with their implementation. And the key idea what they're going to do is that it's basically going to be the leapfrog hash join we just saw, the leapfrog try hash join, or sorry, leapfrog try join, uh, but instead of now storing the actual values of the attributes in the try themselves, they're going to store the hashes for the values just 64-bit values. And the idea is there, that's going to be good enough to do a, a quick comparison to see whether two possible values could even match at all. So that we end up throwing away as much as we can uh, without having to go maybe do deeper, deeper investigations to go read the actual data themselves to see whether there's going to be a match or not. So again, another thing about this is like, you're trying to make the the sort of first peak to see whether this, these two attributes are going to be the same or not, be that cheap as possible, because you know you're going to end up throwing most things away. So within the try itself, the, each node is just going to be another hash table, and they do some tricks of storing things that are raised to do quick lookups inside that, and that's going to be, uh, it's going to have a, the map is going to be, or the hash table is going to map a hash value for a given attribute to a pointer to the, the other parts of the try data structure. And that pointer, actually, pointer could be either a child node or a pointer to the actual tuple repre that's represented by that value. And now because everything's going to be in uh, doing hash, hash, hashes, which are going to be 64-bit integers, we don't need any additional logic in our lookups and, and, and insertions when we build this, this try to, to deal with the different data types we could have. So it's going back to this code specialization idea, but rather than code genning stuff at the very beginning, or, you know, we're, generating code and then compiling it, they just make sure that the data itself is always going to be one data type so that you can have the, a simp, a one, one implementation that has no indirection or no lookups or no branching to deal with different possible data types. And obviously, if it's, if it's hashing, we could have false positives. They argue with something like MemorHash. I think they mentioned AquaHash um, or XXHash from, from Facebook. That's going to be good enough where in most of the times you're not going to have collisions. And so if you do have still collisions, you have, at the very end, you're just going to check to see whether uh, the actual the tuples themselves actually match, uh, even though the hashes don't. So this is the diagram from, from the paper. This is the data structure they're proposing. And I'm going to go through a bunch of different optimizations that they have in here. But again, it's, the, the try itself is not fancy. Um, like they have another data structure called art, 
the ART index, the adaptive radix try that was in early in Hyper. That thing is having different allocations for different nodes, different sizes. All, I don't think they're doing any of that here. The, the real magic is in how they're going to store the pointers and try to do lazy materialization. All right. So you're always going to have to build the, the, the root of the, of, the, of the try. And these are going to be 16 byte buckets. Right? They're going to use 8 bytes or 64 bits for the hash, and then 64 bits for the pointers to the, the actual tuple themselves or the, uh, or the pointers to the next level in the tree. But as I said before, the Germans like sticking things in pointers where they have unused bits. And that's, that's the key thing that they're going to do here. So, that, so I want to go through a couple of optimizations um, of how they're going to use these tag pointers and then how to do late materialization. Because to me, that's the really clever part of what they're doing. Because the, the hash join itself, uh, like the, the, the leapfrog try join, that's, that's been already proposed. They're making it you know, work actually efficiently. So as I said, Germans love sticking things in pointers. Um, we said before, x86-64 only uses 48 bits for memory addresses. The hardware ignores anything else uh, for the other 16 bits. So because you've got to allocate 64 bits, let's, they want to put something in there. So within the, the pointer itself, uh, they're going to use 16 bits to record uh, three additional things. So the first is they're going to have a single bit flag that corresponds to whether something is a singleton or not meaning there isn't going to be a path through the, uh, through, through, sorry, the singleton meaning like there isn't anything in between the, the root node and the bottom node. It's a direct path to, to the leaf nodes. And then they're going to use a, another bit to, to, for this expansion flag just to mean that has, the, the, has the, the nodes below it, have they been allocated and expanded? Because, they, again, they're trying to do lazy materialization. So even though the data structure will have a pointer to something uh, to, a, to lower levels in the try, they're not actually going to materialize it until you actually try to go look it up. So if this flag just says, hey, by the way, you're about to jump some location that hasn't been you know, expanded or allocated yet, so go do that first, then flip this bit, and then uh, traverse down. And to know how to expand it, they're going to maintain the uh, 14 bits for the chain length so that you know... Uh, when you're traversing along the leaf node, what's the number of elements you, you expect to see? Because everything's fixed length, uh, it's always going to be 16 bits or 16, 16 bytes. You know that the size of the chain length is, can, be, can be computed from this, uh, from, you know, from, from this counter here. And then the rest is just going to be the, the 48 bits that the hardware is going to use for memory addresses. Right? We saw this example with the, the hash table. Right? They would store a bloom filter in the 16 bits. Um, there was another example, too, I'm blanking on, too, as well. Uh, yeah, I can't, I, there was another, another example from the Germans that were doing this as well. I forgot what it was. Um, but OK, so let's go through the singleton stuff and how the expansion stuff works. All right, so again, the, the size of the hash tables on the try is going to get smaller and smaller as you go down, because there's end up being uh, Oftentimes, the, the, for, a, for a single, you know, single tuple or sorry, single pair of, of values for an attribute, there isn't going to be a lot of, a, too much duplica duplication as you go down. So you end up with these paths through your try where each node is only going to have one entry. Right? So the idea is that instead of storing the uh, you know, a, a whole separate hash table, uh, or node within the try for, for, an, for, an, for a node that only has one entry at a level, then you just bypass that and skip down to the bottom. Right? So in this case here, for when the hash value, say, is, is somehow value is 0, when we jump down here, we only have one entry inside this. So then now, rather than storing this additional node, just go again, follow the, follow the pointer, go down, look at, look at it, only find one thing, and then traversing down here. Instead, what they do is just have a fast path pointer that takes you d directly down, down here. So then you would use that, that this expansion bit, or sorry, this, this singleton bit, set it to 1 to know that if you're at the root, there isn't going to be anything else below you. You can just jump right down to the, the node at the bottom. Now, you obviously still need to store the, the, the information that was, that was in this guy so that you can actually you know, do the comparison and see whether you actually have a match or not. Um, but again, that's just done down the leaf node. Yes? So the singleton bit can be used anywhere down the 
increase at the moment that you know you're not going to have any more children? Yes. So, the statement is, uh, is the single timid bit used at any point in the tree so that at any moment you look at it and you know that the next thing, you're, the point you're going to follow is to take you to the bottom? Yes. All right, so the next optimization we're going to do, the lazy child expansion. Again, the idea here is that unlike in the, the logic blocks, uh, you know, uh, multi-way join, the worst-case optimal join, where they're populating the entire try before you start even start joining, the idea here is that you would populate the first, the root node. You still have the, you obviously have the tuples at the bottom. But then the idea is that if nothing, when you do the join itself, if there isn't any comparisons along a path in the try, then why instantiate the memory for it and why try to allocate it, right? Only when you actually go to need it, then, then you populate it. So this limits the overhead of trying to build the try in the beginning because you're just building the first level and, and the bottom level, right? So the way it works is like, say in the very beginning, my try would look like this. Um, and th well, this is kind of confusing here, but you would have, uh, you know, you sort of think that the bottom is a linked list that tells you the ordering of, of, of things. So if now I, someone comes along and tries to do a lookup down this path and say this is, we're trying to do a join on two attributes, so I'm missing that second level. So I look, in, I look inside this, I see that the expansion bit is set to zero, so I know that I'm, I don't have anything below me at this point. So then I, I could go do now comparison, or, or, sorry, fast path down to the bottom. I need to do deep, deeper comparisons, and I scan along the leaf nodes to find what I want. But then now I go ahead and populate what the values actually were, and I know how many things I should be looking at because my chain length would tell me uh, when, the, when the expansion bit is set to zero, I, the, this is going to tell me how many things I need to look at at the bottom. So I can then allocate that node, put that here, and then I update the, the, their, the, the new node's pointers to point to different parts of the, of the list at the bottom. Then I go ahead and flip the bit to be one. So now that anybody else comes along, follows down the same path, they'll know that they're actually looking at expanded nodes below me and not the and not directly to the bottom. Yes? Why is it an optimization? Surely, like, don't we want to do as much work on the build side? Or is that not relevant for multiple joins? This question is, why is this an optimization? Don't you want to do as much work as you can on the build side to make the probes go fast as possible? But, yes, but, like, you're trying to join three or more tables all at once, so there's going to be so much memory pressure for that data structure. Think of like trying to build like build complete hash tables for all three tables at the same time. That would be super expensive. Again, think of extremes. Like you know, I, each table is is ten petabytes or, or ten terabytes, right? So this is just trying to minimize the amount of work that or minimize the, the the explosion of memory and storage for your data structure for parts you're never actually going to need. Yeah, this is sort of not clear. So this, this, is, this is all in sort of order. And I think this is going down here. This is going, going over here. And this is just saying that the, think of this as, again, the linked list, how to follow along for the rest of the tuples. Yeah. Actually, I think, so this is actually not in sort of order, right? You have one, three, one, two, two, three. So this is, this is how the original tuples appeared. And now you're just keeping it in that order. But then you're storing linked list. Yeah. So I think you have to do one pass. Uh, you have to do one pass with the data anyway at the beginning, because you have to hash it and figure out what the root is, right? And I think they, they, that's when they construct this linked list. I'd have to double check that. All right, so I'm going to show one graph uh, from, from their paper. Uh, so this one they're comparing against empty-headed, which is the, the thing from Stanford early prototype logic blocks, uh, and then the original version of Umbra, Umbra with the leapfrog try join from the logic blocks guys, and then the Umbra with their uh, hash try. Right? And for this one, they're trying to compute a three-click uh, query, sorry, three-click uh, uh, graph or subgraph from a graph data set from Google Plus, Orkut, and Twitter. Uh, Google Plus was like early, Google's attempt at doing Facebook. Or <laughs> okay, <laughs> or cut was um, the Brazilian Facebook? Yeah. 
who bought and Oracle and Google bought these, right? And then Twitter is well, yeah. <laughs> all right. So again, the the main takeaway is that like the uh, for these these larger graph data sets, the you know the in the case of the Twitter one, I think the graph is highly connected. Uh, so building those data structures in the beginning, the, you know, it's just it's super expensive and they end up just timing out. Whereas the, the late materialization shows the real benefit here uh, because you're, you know, yes, it may, it may, it's not going to run as fast as if you built everything ahead of time, but you have, uh, you know, you're, you don't have too much memory pressure of trying to maintain, again, this data structure to do this, uh, to, to, you know, to do, the, to do the join, right? So again, this is just showing you that the umber hash try is, is preferable over than the, the leaf frog try. So then the real comparison is like this one versus this one, right? Because empty headed is a prototype, it was academic prototype. Logic blocks was again the only commercial system at the time to compare against. Um, right? This is what they care about. Like if you had Germans building your, your hash try and Germans building your leaf frog try, um, then you know the hash try is better. All right, so the, the challenges, though, and the paper brings this up, which is a good point, is that you, need, you still need binary joins. And so I think there was one, ex they had a bunch of experiments where they showed that the, for, for, for workloads like TPCH and the join on a benchmark, if you're just doing binary joins, uh, even when it's not unfiltered, uh, the multi-way join is actually not going to be as, as, as good, right? It's not going to be as performant and, and as, as the, the binary join. It's only the cases when the immediate result size is going to blow up is when you want to use the worst case optimal join, again, as, as we defined in the very beginning. So what you really want is a system that can support both. And then at, at when a query shows up, be able to determine which joins within your query plan should be using one algorithm versus another. It's no different than trying to figure out whether I want to use a sort merge join or a hash join or a nested loop join, which you, know, you typically don't want to use that, but you, you want your optimizer to be able to figure this out. And so in the paper, they talk about how Umbra was able to uh, extend their optimizer using heuristics to basically figure out on the fly, based on the statistics they've collected, whether to use one versus another. And no system can do this. And I'm not trying to advertise for, for, for Umbra, but like logic blocks only did multi-way join. Uh, I think Kuzu only does multi-way join. Yes? I mean, the way they describe it in the paper, it seemed pretty easy. Yes. Said that if it's like there are a lot of binding joints, they're all cascading, then you should just do them all. Yes. Right. But nobody else does that. Also, don't you just hard like hard know that if you're like, for example, joining on binary keys and equity joins, like or primary keys, then like you know that like the data can't blow up, it'll just decide this multiple. So the statement is if you know it's a prime if you do an equity join, inner join, inner join or equity join with on primary keys, do you know it's not gonna blow up? Yeah, but that's like it's like he was saying. It's a bunch of heuristics that figure things out, right? It's, I mean, one of the use cases to say, I know I want to use a binary join. It's like this really this has problems when again you're doing graph traversals with a lot of self joins, right? Because you're like looking up the edge, you're doing joins on the edge table and over again, um, or if you're joining on like non foreign key primary key attributes, then things can blow up. Um, again, it's not that they're not they're they're not as common as foreign key primary key joins. That's probably the most common use case. Um, but they still they still exist enough where like this all falls apart. Okay, so I'm going to quickly finish up and talk about one additional optimization from um, uh, from the Duck to B guys. So it's, it's the guy who wrote the Fast Lanes paper. Uh, the, the people at CWI they 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 had a again experimental branch of Duck DB where they added support for the PG, uh, SQL PGQ extensions uh, on a relational database system, and in this great paper which I, I I, post on, I can post on Piazza. Um, they basically lay out, here's all the things you'd want to have in a relational database system to make a, to, to efficiently support SQL PG, uh, PGQ queries, right? And that they basically opine that all these specialized graph databases that are out there, the Neo4j's and, and so forth, are just fundamentally flawed because they're, they're based on storing edges and, and, and vertices in these inefficient data structures that it don't take advantage of all the last 10, 20 years of developments, developments and optimizations that we've been talking about in this class to make relational queries run faster. So independent of the worst case optimal join, there's a bunch of stuff that we've already covered, like vectorization, uh, better query optimization we'll cover in a second, 
uh, or co co cover later in the semester, um, or compression. All those things which is what you need to make a, uh, a graph query run faster. And that the existing graph databases basically ignored all those developments and went down their own path, and they're going to lose out to relational databases. And I agree to that. I, I agree with that, that, with that statement. So I'm going to show one optimization that we haven't really covered. It doesn't really fit into other parts of the, that we talked about. And you kind of need to understand, OK, when you have the balloon up with these intermediate results in these graph or triangle queries, like this is when you actually want to apply this technique. For bina binary joins, this doesn't make sense. And so the technique is called factorization. And the idea is really, really simple. Basically, rather than materializing duplicate tuples over and over again right, for a join or whatever operator you're trying to generate, you just figure out here's all the actual unique values and maintain a column of, of, of a counter. It says, how many times have, have I seen this, seen, you know, seen this tuple? So now going back to my examples I had before, when I was doing those joins and, and the intermediate results was blow, blowing up, instead of, again, to have to materialize all those results, I could just store it in a factorized form and have a counter. But now the challenge is, in my implementation, all the operators in my system need to be aware of that they're operating on factorized tuples and, and, and be able to account for that. Right? If I'm running a count query, right, you know, this can't be something internal, that's something that, that just gets synthesized and ignored, treated like any other column. The system needs to know, oh, this is a counter column, and you know, adjust the computations accordingly. Simple trick, nobody does this. Uh, but I, again, I, I think this is something that the, the relational guys will eventually have to add, eventually have to add. So here's a graph, here's some graphs from this, again, the paper that I mentioned from the Dr. Yee guys, where they're comparing against Neo4j. They're comparing against the extended version of DuckDB with, uh, with PGQ or SQL PGQ. And I think they only implemented uh, worst case optimal join. I don't think, and they already, obviously already have um, vectorized execution and compression and all the stuff that you know, we talked about so far that DuckDB has. And then they compared against Umbra with their tr uh, tri hash. And the, the main takeaway is that the Neo4j basically gets crushed. Like these are all log scale, right? And so they're running the same, uh, same queries for this uh, it's the, uh, some linked data benchmark. This is something that the, the, the C CBDI is, uh, created with the other uh, graph databases. So this is a bunch of workloads that are trying to do uh, pattern matching on, on graph structures or the, the logical graph. And again, just going down the line for different scale factors, uh, Neo4j gets crushed. And I'm not trying to like, you know, dunk on Neo4j, but like, that's the oldest graph database. They've raised the most money, I think probably like 200 million, right? And this is, when you think of graph database, people think of Neo4j. Uh, and you know, for millions and millions of dollars, you know, they're getting crushed by you know, a ragtag group of Germans, although they're the best Germans, uh, and, the, uh, and the DuckDB people. Right, and that's because again the system, even though it wasn't, they were not originally designed for doing graph graph analytics. By taking advantage of all the optimizations we've talked about so far, uh, plus the worst case optimal join, you know they can crush Neo4j. Neo4j, as far as I know, they store like the there's a separate data structure for the vertices, and then you have pointers to another data structure that keeps track of edges. Right? Yes. Uh, sorry, his, his question is why, uh, wh why is Umbra slower in scale factor 100 than, so why is it faster here than here? Yeah. I don't know, I'd have a good look. Okay, so this is, this is both a, uh, I think you think both of an advertise for, for why you want worst case optimal join, if you want to support these kind of queries, but also like why you don't want to use a specialized graph database, All right? So this is a active, very active area of research. Uh, and as I said, only uh, a small number of systems actually support worst case optimal joins. But I think that's going to change over time. And there's new papers coming out all the, all the time. There was, a, there was a new paper out of um, uh, uh, University, of College, or University of College in London for their sonic join, which beats the hash try join. Um, I, I can post a link to that. But like this, people are actively working this, trying to make this go better. And I think that you know, industry typically is you know, three or four or five years behind academia on this kind of stuff. But as I think now it'll be, with, again, with the, the SQL extension for graph queries, this will get, so start rolling out in more systems. And like I said, once you support SQL PGQ, why would you ever want to use a graph database? 
All right, so next class, before we jump into the system profiling stuff, uh, again, we're going to have on Wednesday, we're going to have project presentations. Everyone's going to get five minutes. We're going to try to be more strict on the time so we, everyone gets through this. Um, and we're going to go in reverse order than we went last time, I promised. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to record or resume the, the talks so that William and I can then watch it again and then provide you guys notes and, and feedback. Because I didn't do that last time. Uh, we lost track of everything. It was just so much. So we're going to record it on my laptop. We won't share it outside. It won't be posted on YouTube. And then we'll, um, and then we'll give you feedback this weekend. Sound good? All right. So this is a quick run through of how to do uh, basically database system profiling. And this, so these slides are a, a few years old, but every, all the techniques are basically work. It's me referencing a system that the previous system we were building, but the high level ideas are, are still the same. Okay. And this is all going to be in C++. I don't know. I'm assuming Rust works the same way. All right. So say we have some 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 programs. So David says we have two functions, foo and bar. And so we want to be able to speed it up with only a debugger. So the really simple way to do this is literally open up GDB, run, you know, run, run the program, and just click you know, pause it, stop it. Then do, print out the stack trace, figure out where, you know, what function you're in, and just record it in the spreadsheet. It's ghetto, but, but it, it, it would work, right? <laughs> uh, so if we do this, and say that we, we, we pause it 10 times, get the stack trace, and then six out of the 10 times we, we were in the function foo. right? So we can basically say that roughly 60% of the time is, is of, of our program, based on, our, based on the data we've collected, is in foo. So bad. It's bad, but like, it's, like, it would work. right? You, you just do it more and more, and then you get better samples. Huh? It's a perf does, right? Yeah, we'll get, we'll get that. yeah basically, yes. His statement is, is this what perf does? Yes, but it has hardware support, not you sitting with, you know, your keyboard like this, all right? All right, so if we, if we say, all right, well, foo is, we're spending all our time in foo. We want to make that run faster. What do we do? Well, this is Amdahl's law, right? So if we say we're going to make foo run two times faster, we want to compute what the overall potential speed up is going to be, right? So we get 60% of our time, foo drops in half. The 40% of our time for the function bar we leave alone. And so Amdahl's law basically tells us that you know, it's going to be whatever the formula here, uh, one over, the, one over the, the percentage of time we're in, in the thing we're trying to optimize, what we're speeding up, and then one minus the percentage of time there. So do, do a plug and chug of the number means that our program will run 1.4x faster. Right? Back of your mind, Omnus law actually works. And keep this in, you, know, you want to keep this in mind when you start figuring out what you actually want to optimize for. So now the question is, how do we actually do something better than hitting with the keyboard? Right? And a high level, there's two approaches. Uh, there's going to be Valgrind and Perf. So Valgrind is a, uh, is, a, is a heavyweight instrumentation of the actual binary itself to basically introduce uh, some timers, if you will, for different function calls. And that it's just going to collect this while the actual program runs in user space. And then at the end, it spits out a, a report you can then visualize and figure out what's going on. Yes? More or less, yes. But co code coverage will tell you what lines are being executed. It's not going to tell you what, where you're spending the time. This is the idea is this, you want to know what the time is. That's what this is. And then perf is going to basically be a, a better version of this. That's going to use hardware counters, which, again, the CPU is maintaining these encounters about like everything. L1, L2, L3 cache misses. How many times did you, uh, how, how, how many branch mis predictions, cycles per instruction, number of instructions. Way, way more things. The hardware is collecting all this information, so you can actually get it for your, your program while it's running. And if you compile with symbols, you can then have it the, in, the, in the perf report actually see what the lines are you know, of code and how many times you're being, you know, running them and, and how much time you're spending in them. So Valgrind would be a... Valgrind is what you used back in the day. It's good. Sometimes the visualization is a lot better. It depends on the tool, and then perf is what you want to use in a, in a modern, you know, modern systems. But it's, it's good to at least look at both of them. So Valgrind is actually a, a collection of, of tools that you can use to do dynamic analysis. Um, memcheck would be, again, looking for leaks. Call grind is what you want to use to figure out how much time you're spending in, in different parts of the code. And then if you want to keep track of like, what parts of the code are 
allocating the most memory over time, you would use a tool called Massive. So to use call grind, you basically would run your program uh, with the val grind command, command line. Tell it I want to run the call grind tool. There's additional flags of how, uh, how verbose or how detailed you want the report to be when it, when it runs, runs your code. And then this is going to spit out this, this call grind.out file. And then you can use a visualization tool like kcache grind to see something like this. And you get a nice, um, nice visualization for here's all the functions, the functions calling this, you know, this other function, how many times it's been invoked, what percentage of the, of the execution of the program was spent in that time, right? So here you see that again the, 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 the cumulative distribution of all the time being spent in different parts of the code. Again, you'll see you know, when you call libraries that are pre-compiled that you don't have symbols for, you, may, you might just see the library name and like a memory address, right? So there's, there's ways to try to get that if you use libraries that, that you compile it yourselves. And then again, here we see the call graph view. And then you can drill into each of these and see additional information. But again, so this is going to be done. Like it generates this information while your program is running. It doesn't have any special privileges. There's no hardware to make, make things run better. So your program is actually going to run slower. So the timing could actually be quite off. Like the wall clock time versus what the real, like when you, when you run with call grind turned on versus like just running you know, by yourself. The timing can be off. And so for you know, this matters a lot for, for race conditions and other things. You may not experience the problems you would see when you run without call grind because it's just running so much slowly. Or you may see issues in, 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 this, in, you know, in this run that you wouldn't see in the production run. So the, the better approach is to use perf. Again, for this one, I think you need root privileges because you have to get you have to have permissions to get stuff, get the, the counters from the hardware. Um, but the basic idea is that you, you're going to start your program with the word perf, perf. You can specify how many cycles, uh, you know, how, how often you want to go check for events, and you know how much how much detailed you want the the traces to be, right? There's there's a bunch of different flags for these things, um, and then the it's going to run your program. I think it runs about the same speed, but again, it has to materialize these results somewhere, right? So it has to start running to disk for the, for this dump file. So like if you're if you're Program is sensitive to like disk I/O, then this can interfere a little bit, but it's not as heavyweight as as call run. So then, after you run your your program in the directory where you ran perf, there'll be like a .dump file or it has some kind of .perf name, um, and then you just use this this perf report tool, and then that'll give you a sort of visualization like this, where again you'll see uh, this is actually measuring the time being spent. So you can, you'll see the, the, you know, the rank list at the top, the ones where you're spending most of the time. And then you, then you can drill into them. And if you compile the symbols, you'd actually see the lines of code uh, that generated these things. Right, so cumulative events and then additional things. So you can click Enter, and you can go see how things, you know, what's actually, what, where you're spending your time. Same thing call grind. You can see lines of code. But again, this is, this is going to be way better. So this is, this is, this is probably two or three, no, maybe four or five years old. Because before we named the system noise page, we named it after my dog. So that's why you see the, the tier name in there. But this is, this is some benchmark we had to, to see how fast we, you know, we can do reads across multiple threads. All right, and there's other third party tools like Hotspot. And that's, it, you, know, you'll, you can see nice things like this. If you ever see these flame graphs, these flame graphs are being generated by, by tools based on perf, right? And now you can see where, you know, again, where you're spending most of your time in. Right, and then this is what uh, this is just saying what, what, what additional things you want to measure. So this is one measuring cycles, last level cache misses, CV utilization, all bunch of stuff. You can tell perf what you want to collect. Okay, so a bunch of these links in, in the slides here. You can go follow along. Again, I'm assuming there, there's there's hooks to do this in Rust. Um, what? No. If you, if you use cargo flame graph, you get a really really nice flame graph. He says if you use cargo flame graph, you get a nice flame graph. I'll, I'll, I'll and that's, I'm assuming that's running perf. Yes. It, yeah, underneath the covers. But you need root privileges, I think, to run perf. I think you can actually just set like an environment variable and it works. But okay. I'll, I'll see. It's in a file, I think, you need root permission to access. Yeah. I think it's different on the Mac and it's for Linux, though. I only did it on Linux, so. I think for, for low level hardware counters, you need, you need, okay. you need administrative yeah. privileges. Okay? Any, any questions about performance counters? Yes. Can you just say one specific function? Like, I want to optimize that function. Uh, what do you mean? Sorry. Yeah, using perf. Let's say you have a huge problem set up, and there's one specific function that you want to optimize. 
All right, so the question is, how would you use perf to optimize one single function? Yeah. Right, so you would get, say, say you use the command line, you get perf report. If you have this one function, so, so one, you can find the function in here, but then you can drill that, you, if you, this is not, this is obviously a screenshot, but you can drill into that function and it'll show you the lines of code and how much time you're running it, how much time you're spending in it. And they can use that to figure out where you're, you know, where you're wasting your time. And it could be because like, you're calling malloc a lot or something stupid in a way you didn't think you were calling and then you can then refactor and optimize that. You can count by cycle, CV utilization, cache misses. Uh, I think, I don't know if you can get memory allocations in this. TLBs would be another one you would care about, right? And those are all, the, the point I'm trying to make is that perf can record things not, that call grind can't about why your program is slow. Call grind will tell you how much time you're spending and how many times you invoked a function, but it actually can't tell you why that function is slow, other than looking at and looking at the lines of code. This will give you like the low level hardware things that we care about. Yes. I think you've been doing uh, there is a, a Git repository from uh, Victor Lies. They have a, a router where where you route your like your code with some calls to perf, and you can like specifically measure uh, uh, functions. Yeah. So his, his point is like. Yeah. Another thing about it, like this is basically this gets everything, uh, and yeah, be too much. And so his point, you can basically put, I don't know if they're like kernel probes or whatever, like whatever their, their invocations tell perf start recording now, and then when you leave the function, turn it off, and then. But like just running this for everything first for like a small portion of of, of, your, of your system will at least tell you what the high level things you want you want to target first. And then you can then drill that into that and say, why am I spending too much time or too many cycles in this part? Also, another question. Like, let's say you want to work with code three. Like, yes. Heavily optimized, right? So first, uh, you can uh, keep debug symbol on even if you want to do it. Yeah. That's kind of cursed, though. Like, annoying, but. Symbols, are, symbols are separate than uh, like compilation, compilation optimizations, right? Because again, you need this. So, so, it get away. so you like perf will, they'll show you the lines of source code, mm -hmm. uh, but then you, you can then get assembly view. You can actually then see the assembly. So then you gotta like if you want to start thinking what what did O3 do to change my 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 beautiful C++ Rust code to something bizarre, you gotta look at the assembly. There's no other way to do it. Oh, so your statement is, is there a way to prevent O3 from majorly yeah. rewriting your function so that you can, can debug it? Yeah, especially for micro because you're not going to require the default. Yeah, are you talking like inlining? Yeah. Oh, you can just tell if it's not inlining. Yeah, but like, okay. Like, not use, means, means uh, uh, remote not used. Yeah. yeah, but in that case, the compiler might be doing the right thing. We can take this offline, but like, yeah. All right, other questions? OK, awesome. All right, again, next class, presentations. Um, and then, uh, I mean, I've office hours now. I'm happy to talk, talk, talk if you guys want. And then um, just make sure you send me the slides and your, 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 your document before class starts, OK? All right, and I don't think it should be 60 degree weather in February, but enjoy it. Got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40, and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw my three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint I red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the suds. Billy D is the silly cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man to get a can of St. Isles.